Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to SOAS, if this is the first time that you're coming here. My name's Nina Arif. I'm part of a, a group called ICOP, which works within SOAS, as part of SOAS. And um, we've been holding a number of events um, in, a, in a series on Palestine. So this is the latest event we have in our series. Um, I'm going to hand you over to our chair, Lindsay German, um, and she will introduce the panel and get things started. Um, for those of you who don't know, Lindsay German is a founding member and convener of the Stop the War Coalition. She's authored several books. She's an activist, and we're really happy that she is chairing for us today. Over to you, Lindsay. Thanks very much, Nina, and thanks, everybody, for coming tonight. We have um, an amazingly illustrious panel that I'll introduce one by one as they're... Uh, as they're uh, what is, what, sorry, is, Anyway, so I will introduce them one by one. I wanted to say a few things myself before, before introducing them, and that is to say that this topic that we're talking about, about the media and the um, war in Gaza, is to me one of the most important things because one of the very dramatic things about the, the war in Gaza is the number of journalists who have been killed, the fact that people cannot report openly from Gaza, they're prevented from doing so, and the fact that there are many, many things that we don't hear about, or we only hear about from social media, we don't hear about from mainstream media at all, or as I was saying a little bit earlier, the latest revelations, these horrible revelations about these mass graves with people um, with their hands tied behind their backs and so on. This was on social media several days before um, it was anywhere on Channel 4 News or any of the other mainstream outlets. So I think there are many, many questions that um, that need to be answered. And I think our panel tonight is going to go a long way towards answering and discussing lots of these questions. I'd also like to just make a, a, a couple of general points about our government and the United States government. Um, the United States government this week um, voted to send another $26 billion dollars of aid, a lot of it military aid, to the um, to Israel. Um, this is the same time where, as you will have seen, there are student occupations taking place right across the United States, and I hope that we can all show our support for the uh, students who are occupying and who are being treated extremely badly by the police and by the uh, university authorities and being accused of all sorts of things, including anti-Semitism. So, uh, we have, on the one hand, this support for Israel. We also have growing repression in the United States. We've seen it in Germany, where a conference on Palestine was closed down, um, and a noted doctor, uh, Dr. Ghassan Abu Sitta, was uh, refused entry into Berlin in order to take part in the uh, conference. And, of course, we see it here. We see it here with um, restrictions on our demonstrations and... Um, on the way in which people are able to express themselves on the demonstrations. There's been attempts by the former and unlamented um, Home Secretary Suella Braverman to stop people from even flying Palestine flags. You know, this has been the level of attempt to suppress the solidarity which millions of people around the world are showing for the Palestinians. So uh, I would just say that in Britain, I think I'm very proud of the role that we've played in building a solidarity movement. I know that many of you will have been involved in all the different activities. Every day there are activities going on around the country uh, over, over Palestine, and these are going to continue. So um, it's in this context, and uh, just as a little plug, we have another big demonstration, Parliament Square, 12 o'clock on Saturday, if any of you can make it. I hope many of you will, and I'm sure many of you will. So that's enough from my introduction, just to say um, we have Gideon Levy, Mike Berry, uh, Professor Dina Mata and Stephen Methuen. Um, I'll introduce them all as they speak. So firstly, I'd like to introduce Gideon Levy. He's um, speaking to us uh, from Israel. Um, he's an Israeli journalist and author. I'm sure many of you 
uh, will have uh, will will know his writing and will know his work. And I know many people that I know have started reading Haaretz much much more in the last few months and find it a very valuable source of uh, of writing. He writes for Haaretz and has won awards for his articles on human rights in the Israeli occupied territories. In 2021, he won Israel's top award for journalism, the Sokolov Award. Gideon authored The Punishment of Gaza in 2012, and his new book, The Killing of Gaza, Reports on a Catastrophe, will be released later this year, and very much, I'm sure, we'll all look forward to reading that. So welcome, Gideon, and thank you very much for joining us. I hope everyone will give Gideon a good London welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to be with you because I always like to be with SOAS people, but uh, I wish I could be with you physically, but that's second best uh, to talk to you from a distance. And our uh, subject tonight is uh, obviously the coverage of the war, not the war itself. And I would like to say a few things about the Israeli media. I think this is the most painful time of the Israeli media ever. And I will elaborate and try to explain why. The Israeli media, as a part of you know, is quite a free media. Military censorship still exists, very shameful phenomena, but it is really marginal. The Israeli media mostly is private owned, and the main motivation is to increase the, the readership, to increase the rating. It is quite a free media. It is quite a courageous media when it comes to political issues, economical issues, investigations against politi polit politicians. Not something to be ashamed of. But when it came throughout the year, to covering the occupation or to cover the wars, it was always very shameful. But what happened in the last half year is unprecedented. Unprecedented. An average Israeli who lives in Tel Aviv with quite a lot of knowledge and interest saw less of Gaza than a average. British citizen in a small town in northern uh, England. We see nothing. Israel is not covering Gaza. We have now half a year of 24-7 news, newspapers, TV, radio, social media. Focus only on one issue, the war in Gaza. But we see only one side. We hear endlessly about the hostages, endlessly about the soldiers, endlessly about the, the killed soldiers, the brave soldiers, the tragedy of the hostages again and again in a loop, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The only thing which we don't see at all is the suffering of Gaza. Now, nobody told the Israeli media not to inform about the suffer of Gaza. Nobody told the Israeli media to betray so much its professional duty, which is first of all to tell the full story. Nothing to do with political attitude or ideological point of view. It's about being professional journalists who tells the full story. And if some of you would come over to Israel, you wouldn't believe what you see. People will deal with the hostages day and night. It should be covered and should be the, the discussed again and again. But when children are dying on fancy floors, on, on, on Dirty floors of hospitals, as you can see in any network. When starvation is so strong in Gaza, when 
one million people are without hope, without future, without present, without nothing. And nothing of this is being presented to the Israeli audiences and readership then you understand that it is a real betray, a professional betray. We used to laugh at the Russian media, which covers in such a biased way the war in Ukraine, and rightly so. The Israeli case is much worse, because the Russian media is functioning within a totalitarian framework, a Putinist regime, which doesn't leave much, much choice for the, for the journalists and for the media to take any alternative way but to serve the government and the propaganda. Israeli media has the choice. Israeli media has the freedom. And they deliberately chose not to show, not because someone forced them to do so, not because someone told them to only because they know that this is what their readership and viewers are expecting them to do. Only because they want to please them and only to please them. Only because they know that anything else will create some kind of, of resistance, of uncomfort in Israeli public opinion. And the media perceives itself in Israel as, I would say, an entertainment organ, not a, a journalistic organ. And when I speak about the media, I always speak about most of the mainstream media. Are it is by far totally excluded, not because I work there, because it is the only newspaper in Israel. All the rest are entertainment uh, networks to do less to, to please the viewers. To dehumanize the Palestinians, not because of ideology, to dehumanize them in order that we will feel good about them. Because if the Palestinians are not human beings, if all Gaza are Hamas terrorists, so there is no problem with what, with what Israel is doing in the last half year in Gaza. And that's exactly the service to the Israeli media voluntarily offers to its customers. Watch us and you will feel good about yourself. Read us and you will not have any moral doubt. Now this phenomenon, as I said before, is not new because that's the way that Israeli media is covering the occupation and the apartheid for decades. And people like me think that that's part of the success of the occupation of the apartheid, thanks to the media, the biggest collaborator with, with the occupation, with the apartheid, <coughs> Israelis don't have many questions about it and feel good about themselves. But as I said before, in this war, it reached a place where we never were. Never were well, in such a shameful place. Now it starts with total one sided information, but it continues also in bringing to the discourse, to the table, only one view. You can hardly, I, I, I can be personal for, for a moment, I used to participate in panels in Israel for the last years. Of be regularly, weekly, daily. I was hardly invited. I was invited twice ever since this war started. And it's not my problem. It is the problem of the media who is interested now only in one voice, only in one opinion, supporting the war, supporting the mass killing, supporting the destruction, supporting the starvation. And we don't want to hear anything else. Now, I don't have to tell you what are the consequences. The consequences are a brainwash system, a propaganda system, which is dread as free media, but is far from free media, a very militaristic spirit in Israel, 
never will be so many touristic. If you open the newspapers, it looks like a, a publication of the army and nothing else but the publication of the army. And this is what the average Israeli gets. He has the option to turn to Sky News or BBC or, or Al Jazeera English or, or CNN or many other uh, networks. But you know, Israelis are not so interested in knowing the truth. And if you don't bring it to their, to their home, most of the Israelis will be very pleased and not make any effort. They know somewhere in the back of their mind that something terrible is going on in Gaza. But if you don't see it, if you don't feel it, if you don't witness it, if you don't see the children, it is really, I mean, the figures, yes, the figures are known, but figures are only figures. And the Israelis, after half a year of this war, are still supporting it quite with a lot of enthusiasm. Most of the Israelis and the polls show it are supporting, continuing the war, getting into Rafa, not stopping the war, even in the price of the fate of the hostages. And all this is thanks to the Israeli media, a free media, which betrayed its, its mission. And I, I'm very, very sorry that that's the situation. I can only tell you that history will judge the Israeli media will be remembered as the biggest collaborator, both with the occupation and with this war in Gaza. Thank you very much, Gideon. I hope you'll be able to stay for the Q&A as well at the end. Uh, but thanks for that really useful introduction to the, to the meeting. I'd next like to ask uh, Dr. Mike Berry to speak. He's a reader in, uh, at Cardiff University's School of Journalism, Media and Cultural Studies. He's one of the authors of Bad News from Israel in 2004 and More Bad News from Israel, published in 2011. Mike's research has been reported on in various media outlets, including The Guardian, The Jerusalem Post, Al Jazeera, and the BBC. So um, please give a good welcome to Mike Berry. Okay, thank you very much. Um, just first of all, I'd like to say thank you very much for inviting me down here to talk. Um, I'm going to talk a bit today about um, my research that um, carried on over the last two decades. Um, most of this research was carried out up until 2011. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but also talk about some of the continuities that I think you'll find in relation to the, the kind of current coverage that's going on. So the research that we did um, in our books looked at what we, we took we termed the whole circuit of communication. So at one level we were interested in looking at what structured the production of media messages, how journalists operated, what, what pressures and structures they operated within. We were also interested in the messages themselves that audience members um, got access to. And we were also interested in looking at how they influenced public knowledge and attitudes about the conflict. So we did extensive audience work with, with focus groups and, and using surveys to try and kind of tease out where people were getting their information and how it was affecting what they knew and thought about the conflict. Um, and we brought senior journalists such as Lindsay Hilson from Channel 4 and the late George Alagaya into our audience group so they could actually see how their news broadcasts actually affected kind of public knowledge and understanding. Um, and the studies we did look primarily at the time at broadcast news because during the time of kind of the Second Intifada and the Gaza War around 2008, 2009, we knew that that was the, the overwhelming, the important source of information for people about the conflict. Of course, nowadays you also have other sources of information, particularly obviously social media um, and channels like um, Al Jazeera, which have also become in increasingly important in actually influencing uh, public knowledge and attitude. So they become much more important in terms of the formation of opinion. And the purpose of our research was not to kind of point fingers at individual journalists, but to start a conversation about how their broadcasters 
are their broadcasts actually affecting public knowledge and understanding? And I'll just kind of give you six key findings that we got from our, our, our big pieces of research. The first was that essentially TV news says almost nothing about the history or origins of the conflict. For the Palestinians, the loss of their uh, homes and land when Israel was created in 1948 and the military occupation under which they've lived since 1967 are fundamental, but they're very, very rarely mentioned or explained in TV news. And instead, we tend to find that TV news, particularly during the time of the Second Intifada, was just suffused with images of violence. And we asked journalists, why? Why is this? Why do you not provide any context or, or background or, or history? And they said, well, George Elagaya said to us, I'm constantly being told by my editor that the average viewer has a very short attention span of a few seconds. And unless we grab them with very dramatic imagery, there's a danger that they will switch over. So we were told, you know, don't feature explainers. We want bang, bang. The second key thing we found that with, without any historical context provided, tele, uh, television news tended to um, work within two frameworks. It explained the violence as a kind of blood feud, as a kind of cycle of violence. One side attacks, then the other side, you know, then attacks back. Um, and the other way it tended to be um, explained was within the framework of Palestinians as initiating the conflict and Israelis as responding or retaliating to what had been done to them. So on one of our samples, we found that the Israelis were described as responding or retaliating about six times as often as the Palestinians were. And this had an impact on how people saw the conflict in our audience groups and that they, they themselves began to see the Palestinians as having started all the problems. We also found there's far more space given to Israeli perspectives, and this was magnified by the coverage of, of US politicians who were frequently featured and who tended to support Israeli um, <coughs> positions. And this wasn't just a case of kind of direct speech from, from sources and, and reported speech. It was also that journalists themselves often just inserted the Israeli rationale into their coverage quite frequently. Um, we also found there was very little information about the, the social, economic, and the political consequences of living under occupation, such as restrictions on movement, uh, land, loss of land, and human rights abuses, um, including the use of torture and humiliation. These things were just not routinely covered in news accounts. In fact, the, the, the occupation was rarely explained in terms of its consequences. We found there was more space given per capita to Israeli deaths and different kind of language used to describe the killing of Israelis. So words like murder, lynch mob, barbarically killed. These were used to describe the deaths of Israelis, but typically not Palestinians. And our final kind of finding was, well, how does this affect public knowledge and understanding? And what we found was, first of all, that there was huge confusion about what the conflict was about because there wasn't any explanation of the main um, political dimensions of the conflict and locating it within the history of the conflict, people were confused about the most basic elements. In some of our groups, we found that more people actually thought that it was the Palestinians who were the settlers and the Palestinians were occupying the occupied territories rather than the Israelis. And few people actually knew what occupation actually yeah. meant. Many just thought that the area was occupied by someone in the same way a bathroom might be occupied. People couldn't understand the Palestinian rationale. They thought they were perhaps just bad neighbors who couldn't get along uh, with the Israelis. One, one person said, oh, you know, the problem is all the Palestinians are you know, letting their children go out and throw stones at the Israelis. Um, and, and then somebody else in the audience group explained that they were living under military occupation and what it involved. And then the woman immediately turned around and said, crikey, if, if, I'd, if, you'd, if you were under that condition, you'd be out there throwing stones too. So the lack of kind of conflict, um, context and detail and, and explanation of the Palestinian rationale affected how people saw it. Um, and the other kind of key thing that we found was that um, people actually turned away without an explanation of, of why the two sides were fighting in any context. People found the, the coverage a, a huge turnoff and they tended to kind of lose interest and not want to watch the conflict. And, and the kind of key bottom line all of, the, of this is that TV news kind of stifled a kind of rational public debate about how the conflict could be brought to an end. And it meant there was very little actual pressure from the public um, on uh, policymakers to actually pursue policies that were likely to lead to um, a resolution of the conflict.
thing. Now, I'd say now that that was some huge, very detailed studies we did over many years, and we don't have the systematic data in and research yet on the current conflict, but there are certainly some kind of continuities that we can see in the reporting since October last year. First of all, the use of language. Um, it's clear, and we, we have done some preliminary analysis on this, that certain kinds of words like murder, mass murder, brutal murder, massacre, horrific massacre, atrocity, slaughter, these words are, are used almost exclusively to describe the deaths of Israelis, but almost never certainly not in terms of journalists using them directly as opposed to reported speech used to describe the deaths of Palestinians. So the kind of language is, is, is very, very different. And this is true both at the, uh, we've seen at the BBC, it's also true at The Guardian, and there's been some research come out that it's also true in other publications in the United States, such as the New York Times, um, the LA Times and the Washington Post. Another key thing that we found on reporting since October the 7th is that um, there's been a tendency to start the conflict on October the 7th. So, for instance, a BBC online re report stated the conflict began when Gaza-based gunmen from Hamas attacked southern Israel on the 7th of October, killing about 1,200 people and taking about 240 others hostage. The Palestinians, of course, would, would kind of contest this notion that... Um, the conflict started on that particular date and they would see themselves as resisting the actions of Israel stretching back many decades. Um, and in fact, it's actually routine across many media outlets when discussing what Israel has been doing since October to routinely insert the events of October the 7th to act as contextualization for Israeli actions. But that doesn't happen for Palestinian actions. So we couldn't find any examples of where for instance, the blockade or, or, or the occupation was discussed as part of the context for, um, for, the, um, for, for what happened on October the 7th. Obviously, the, the UN Secretary General uh, mentioned it and it became controversial, but we found it wasn't routinely referred to at all in the way of what, what happened on October the 7th was used as a context for what Israel has been using. Um, and... What we also tended to find is that um, there was a lot of kind of reporting from the Israeli perspective um, and things would be said about what Israel was doing, which would never be said about what Palestinians were doing. I'll give you a couple of examples. So, for instance, on BBC Online, um, a, a, a leading BBC journalist interviewed a, um, an Israeli um, general and he described him as straight talking when he said that innocent civilians would have to be killed and when Israel crushed its enemy and that we needed to be tough. And I have to say it would be completely inconceivable that any Palestinian group would be given space to describe the need to kill Israeli civilians, let it alone be described as straight talking when doing so. Okay. Um, on 6th of October, the BBC Online um, featured uh, the headline, Six Months On, How Close Is Israel to Eliminating Hamas? Okay. We, we couldn't find any, you know, couldn't find any examples from the media of, of, of the BBC talking about, you know, six months on, how, how close are the, the Palestinians to throwing off the occupation or ending the system of apartheid that they see them being on. One kind of version that there's a tendency in the media to view the conflict from one side. And there's other things we could also say about this BBC um, report about um, eliminating Hamas. Um, the, the, the notion that you have the right to eliminate a, a, a group is, will be seen as controversial under international law and there will be some, certainly some international lawyers and I've spoken to some of them who will say, you know, you have the right under international law to stop an attack and also to stop any other imminent attacks but the idea that you have the right to eliminate a group, um, that's questionable under international law and certainly we know some of the, the methods that have been used to do that, such as the use of some of the AI systems like Lavender and Gospel and Where's Daddy, where it said the Israelis have had targeted fighters specifically at home and ended up killing their families. That too is, is highly controversial under international law. But in, in the article we I, I highlight from the BBC, that, that wasn't mentioned at all. So um, I would say there are some significant continuities. As I say, though, we don't have the systematic data yet on the current conflict. There are some significant continuities from what we found before in the coverage. Thank you.
Thanks very much, Mike. That was uh, really, really fascinating. So uh, the next speaker we've got is <coughs> Professor Dina Matar, who's the director of the Centre for Global Media and Communications here at SOAS, and also uh, the chair of the Centre for Palestine Studies here. So uh, a great expert on all these things. Before joining academia, uh, Dina worked as a foreign correspondent for Reuters in the Middle East and has worked with a number of other news agencies as well. She's co-founder and co-editor of the Middle East Journal of Culture and Communication. So welcome, Dina. Thank you. Thank you so much. I came prepared with two talks because uh, I thought if Mike doesn't talk about one issue, then I will talk about it. But if he talks about that issue, then I'll talk about something else. Uh, but I would like to thank uh, Gideon for mentioning the Israeli media and the way that the media is in, in a democratic country uh, should be a space for uh, different opinions, but that is becoming restricted. Um, and maybe in questions and answers, uh, I will, you know, I'm very happy to answer questions why it matters, why language matters, and why uh, particular narratives can become normalized, taken for granted, and so on. So these are the areas that I have been looking at, looking at. But what I want to talk about here today is kind of more conceptual and thinking about the right to communicate. Um, so I'm going to start with Edward Said, who wrote a, in an essay in 1984, talked about the Western media coverage and public discourse of the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 1982 as producing dominant narratives about the Palestinians as terrorists and the Israelis as merely acting out of self-defense. The narrative he proposed was the product of two levels of censorship. One, the silencing in the media in particular of certain opinions, particularly those critical of Israel, and two, the absence of a counter narrative, meaning a narrative about the story and future of the Palestinians as they, they themselves see it. Today, almost 40 years since its publication, and judging by even the, even the most cursory analysis of the Western media and public discourse of the genocidal Israeli assault against Palestinians in Gaza, we can say nothing has changed, except, except perhaps substituting, substituting the call uh, for permission to narrate, as I propose here, with a call for a permission to communicate as a basic human right and as proposed by Article 19. This right, I suggest, has been denied the Palestinians through the following uh, practices. The first one, targeted use of violent language by Israeli officials and army personnel, along with vicious uh, Israeli PR campaign aimed at dehumanizing Palestinians and legitimizing Israel's strategy and plans. This language has been repeated by some Western officials and some Western media, including the BBC, without questioning their meanings and their implications in a dangerous context for ordinary Palestinians. There are many examples about the BBC, but the BBC coverage in particular has been all too often dependent on amplifying official sources from Israel and reproducing their language. And of course, we have to remember the context here is that Israel has so far denied access to Western journalists to Gaza. So the only access is, you know, the only reporting that's coming from the ground is by Palestinian journalists who are also killed. There's more than 100 Palestinians, Palestinian journalists who have been, yeah. been killed. We have to take that into account. So when the IDF uh, stepped up its catastrophic bombardment of Gaza on 27th of October, 2023, BBC online headlines simply ran with the Israeli narrative that this was merely a question of expanding activity, quote unquote, instead of questioning, as others were doing, whether this was an actual war crime. When Israel bombarded the Jabalia refugee camp on 31st of October, a BBC World tweet with 11.5 million views simply said, quote, dozens reported killed in explosion in North, at Northern Gaza refugee camp. In contrast, if we look at Al Jazeera, which I think has been really excellent in reporting, particularly in the use of language, in the variety of sources it has used, Al Jazeera was quite clear in its reporting, dozens killed in an Israeli attack on Jabalia camp. It is hard not to think um, of the double standards operating when the BBC uh, was content uh, to tweet earlier in October, Russian airstrike kills 51 at a funeral in Ukraine. And we know the debates around the uh, discrepancy in the reporting. 
The second practice is the exclusion of Palestinian voices, the silencing of progressive voices, and the exclusion of the historical context, which Mike has talked about, so I'm not going to uh, repeat that. While some might say there has been a slight shift in language, critical media scholarship over the years has shown that the first framing, the first language use of events, particularly in international news and in the context of an asymmetrical war, um, matters. This is because international news, even in the digital age, continues to be dominated by the major international news media organizations, which, ha which have a quasi-monopoly for providing prime definitions of breaking news in the world. So, uh, first frames, what are the first frames? You know, Israel is just defending itself. This is a war against terror. So the frame of the war of terror was used extensively and to a particular effect. Of course, first framing is not produced out of thin air, but it, because of journalists' reliance on official sources for news, which is a common journalistic practice. Example of first frames are those used by Israeli officials that refer to Palestinians, and this is uh, even documented as non-humans and animals and savages. The Israeli Foreign Ministry has reportedly spent $1.5 million in targeted adverts using offensive language since October 7. And I don't know whether any of you have access to the social media and telegram, and there's really some atrocious material coming out from various Israeli uh, officials and, and soldiers on the ground. Uh, it is interesting, uh, though, that the BBC regularly uses the word atrocities when talking about the Hamas attacks, but a search of its prolific social media output on X, formerly Twitter, uh, finds not a single mention of the word genocide, which, uh, despite, uh, despite the fact that it, it, you know, experts from the United Nations have used that term to define the war against uh, Palestinians. The third, uh, third practice is persistent Israeli war practices aimed at silencing ordinary Palestinian voices, including the disconnection of all communications and access to the outside world on different occasions in Gaza, mm -hmm. normally before an attack is about to, um, to take place. So watch this space. Let us see what is going to happen before they're going to go into the uh, uh, you know, kind of threatened uh, inv ground invasion of Rafah. This silencing has taken many forms, including the killing of whole families together. So killing, again, the right to communicate, but also the right to memory, which is, again, a human right. And this is something that people like myself, who are interested in oral history, and people uh, talking about their experiences will really find very difficult, you know, what, what, what is going to happen. So these three practices produce what I propose, like uh, a disciplinary, a punitive communicative apparatus that willfully overlooks most of the basic things that might present Israel in a bad line, and that punishes those who try to tell the truth by countering the Israeli narrative. You might ask why focus on mainstream media when we have social media platforms, which do provide a space for voice for the marginalized and the victims. Um, I'm very happy to answer the questions about this later. But it is important to acknowledge that the war is also played out in social media, mostly as a war over truth, legitimacy, narrative, and identity. It is also important to note that unlike other genocidal wars, the attacks and narratives have played out and being witnessed in detail on social media and other platforms. And people are just watching, you know, it's almost like genocide is becoming a taken for granted uh, practice. Past genocide, each um, uniquely horrific in its own way, occurred when modes of communication were different, distances vast, and killings <clears throat> occurred out of sight of most people who could shrug their shoulders with indifference. Time and future research will tell whether and how these battles might influence opinions or uh, progress on the ground. However, based on available research, the evidence of a shift in public opinion because of social media use in war is not clear. It's not, you know, we, we haven't reached, it's in, inconclusive. Particularly because of the structured feature, features, structural features of social media platforms, the intimate link between media and power, algorithmic bias, misinformation, and propaganda. And again, social media is not a neutral platform. Okay, it's not an equal or a neutral uh, uh, platform. 
So these three, um, three practices, they pose a real dilemma for an ethical dilemma for journalists and media outlets covering the war, particularly because of the need to take into account complex factors and facts that have influenced the framing of these issues for more than, de uh, for more than three decades and research that Mike and his colleagues have uh, carried out is a testament to that. The most dangerous outcome of this strategy is the use of the anti-Semitic frame that haunts all supporters of Palestine and Palestinians, but that might be evoked when, even when the historical context after s more than 75 years of settler colonial Israeli practices and repression of the Palestinians is evoked. Um, this is clear in the ways in which Israel had until October the 7th pushed for the definition of anti-Semitism to be expanded to include criticism of the Israeli state and questioning the moral bias of uh, Zionism. And as we see now, even contextualizing and historicizing the background of the ongoing war by Israel against Palestinians and its outcome could also trigger an, an accusation of anti-Semitism at any time. In fact, as many scholars have uh, warned, the uh, dehistorization of these events aids Israel and governments in the West in pursuing policies they shunned in the past to, due to many ethical uh, considerations. Uh, I want to finish here and you know, open to questions. I understand I don't have time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dina, and we will have some time for questions and for people to ask, ask our panelists questions um, after our final speaker, who is Stephen Methven. Um, I'm delighted to uh, have him here. He's a writer and researcher for Navarra Media, which, as people know, is one of the main kind of alternative media sources that, that we have. And he, is, he works on the nightly news and politics show Navarra Live, which must be a lot of work. Um, he's currently working on a book based on Navarra's reporting of Israel's war on Gaza, which examines how and why Western English language media has failed so spectacularly to tell the truth about the conflict. Thanks, Stephen. Um, thank you. <coughs> um, and uh, yeah, thank you for inviting me. It's a, a, a real honor to be here on this panel. Um, so um, as Lindsay said, you know, I'm here as a practitioner. Uh, my job is to write uh, at least some of Navarra Live every day, which is our nightly news and politics show with the host. We write the scripted part of the show together. And mostly what I've worked on uh, is the, because I'm also the researcher, I tend to do the more uh, research heavy parts of the job, which means a lot of the actual reporting on what has been happening in Gaza. Um, and so I thought what I did, so what I did in preparation here is just to reflect on some principles that have guided our coverage. And it's been, I mean, gratifying is the wrong word, but it's been quite, qu quite useful to hear that actually some of the things that uh, Mike and Dina were talking about are things that we actually anticipated in our own coverage as resisting. Um, and that have been like, I, I think, and in the way in which these five principles that I'm going to mention now, a lot of them are so basic that you'd think they wouldn't need to be mentioned at all. They seem like basic journalistic principles, and yet they are uh, neglected constantly in the English-speaking media in the West. And I'm speaking mostly about British media, because that's what I'm most familiar with, but also to some extent uh, of media in, in the US. So the first principle that's guided our, our coverage is that the past is your best guide to the unfolding present. So when October the 7th happened, we immediately started to think about the reaction that was going to come. So that was where our focus was straight away. Um, and in covering the unfolding attack on Gaza, um, we have always thought, well, I think that journalists are, are very interested in reporting facts. They're very inter interested in reporting one kind of fact, which is events. Uh, you select events and you put them together to give a picture of what's happened. Um, but events don't give you the whole story at all because there are other kinds of, of facts that don't get reported and those are the structural facts. The structural facts are actually what situates those events in a context that gives the audience a piece of understanding about what's happening. And I think we have tried constantly to report, to, 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 to um, inform our reporting 
by either an awareness in, in our actual creation of the reporting or an articulation of those structural facts explicitly in the reporting. Uh, so I think that's a very that's a that's that's a, a place at which the media just you know the mainstream media has 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 really I think failed. Um, the mainstream media in Britain is uh, dominated by a certain kind of liberalism, um, which I think that we try very hard to avoid. And by liberalism, I mean a kind of political view which places front and center the individual as the unit of like political structure. Um, and when you do that. Uh, what, come, become, what, what becomes centered in the narrative or, or what you think is good or bad is not, actual, not, not an actual standpoint that allows rational engagement, but rather the aesthetic and emotional reactions of the individual. And I think that that's something that has been widespread throughout uh, British, British coverage um, of, um, you know, especially at the, at, at the beginning where there was a lot of emotion uh, that journalists seemed to be unable to abstract from. Um, and so, yeah, so we, we've been very careful, I think, to avoid that kind of, um, uh, you know, because of, like, one, of one of the issues with, with the liberal, as I conceive of them, is that they're very happy with violence so long as they don't see it. And when they do see it, they object to it. And what they object to is its aesthetic rather than its actual fact. And I think that's something that, you know, we have tried to, you know, cl clearly in be against violence, um, but without, um, as it were, just talking about the violence that's that's visible um, or imme immediately visible. Um, and also part of that is resisting a framing which has been so dominant, which is a war on terror framing, a, a framing of conflicts in the Middle East which have you know, basically informed my entire adult life. Um, uh, and part of doing that is, for example, being very strict with ourselves about regarding Hamas or other armed groups in Gaza as rational actors with, with strategies, with motives, um, uh, with plans, just as the mainstream, the, the mainstream media regards um, Israel in that way. Um, we've been very careful, I think, to, uh, to, to maintain that kind of conception of, um, of, 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 of Hamas. Um, the third one is to, and I was going to say, so, so I suppose what I'm talking about here is a particular standpoint that abstracts from your own position in, in a kind of narrativized uh, world where you've already been told what you're supposed to think about this conflict from, 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 the, from the word go. Um, the third one is to constantly assert the humanity of Palestinians and reflect it in our coverage. And part of that humanity is to affirm uh, the basicness of their demands. And so one very basic demand is a demand not to be killed. Um, another basic demand is a demand for self-determination. Uh, another basic demand is a demand for a just reckoning with history. Another basic demand is a demand to access the mechanisms of international justice. Um, so to constantly affirm these as the rights of people in Palestine just as much as they're the rights of anybody else. Sorry, I just have a sip of water. Um, and a further feature of that is, I think, to, um, to also uh, treat journalists in Gaza as journalists, which I think the mainstream media here does so little. And this is something that I learned um, what, that I felt most keenly actually two years ago when Shireen Abu Akleh was killed. Um, and she was killed next to a young journalist who reported to the media what had happened and nobody believed her and nobody reported it. Nobody gave her the respect that any other journalist would have deserved. And so I think that what we constantly try to do is use the, the reportage of uh, uh, journalists in Gaza I'm occasionally in contact with some of them as well, and we try to use footage when we can. It's not always easy because we have quite a quick turnaround, but in the past we have, we have used various bits of footage. Um, I'm on a group, a uh, WhatsApp group with journalists in Gaza, and which is you know, where I check every day uh, to try and assess things on, on the ground. Um, so that is also part of this, you know, asserting the humanity of Palestinians constantly, um, including of 
the journalists, as and as as Gina said, you know, over a hundred of them have been killed um, in this in, 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 in this assault. Um, we also want to uh, maintain trustworthiness in our journalism. Um, and now I think most journalists want to maintain trustworthiness in, in, in their journalism. And so that means uh, substantiate, substantiating um, uh, information as it comes in. Um, and of course you want to do that for your own sake as a journalist, you want your audience to be able to trust what you're putting out to them. Um, but I think our approach has always been, you know, if something comes in on social media or you know some, you know, some story starts to um, to bubble up, um, it'll be a priority, and it's coming from from inside Gaza. It's a priority for us to do our very best to substantiate to substantiate that as quickly as possible, and to keep the threshold for substantiation uh, relative to what's possible in this in this situation. So, for example. Um, you know, in other situations, you might require a much higher threshold of um, verification. Here, there is no way of verifying things beyond a certain level because there is there's very little access to what's happening in, Ga in Gaza. And so allowing ourselves to just sit well with the standard of verification, which is actually possible. Um, but also, at the same time, we don't want to unwittingly participate in an atmosphere which wants to discredit Palestinians. So we don't want to just... Um, um, oh, thank you. We don't want to just air anything or claim that any, you know, anything that comes up on social media is correct. So a recent, you know, a story which is I think occupying us all at the moment are the mass graves at NASA and Al Shifa, um, and you know, there's a lot. I think quite a lot of misinformation on um, social media about the extent of people with their hands tied and so on and so forth. And we've been very careful to try to only report. Uh, what we can substantiate or what other media outlets have been able to substantiate. Um, and, you know, obviously that's an un un unfolding story, but it's, and I think this is something that's, you know, the very interesting case, I think this is something that Hamas is quite keen on as well, is that there isn't misinformation coming out of Gaza. So there was a very interesting case um, when at the Al Shifa hospital where a woman claimed that IDF soldiers had been sexually assaulting people and making people have sex in front of their children and things. And Hamas did an investigation and through Al Jazeera came out and said, actually, this person was not speaking the truth. Um, and so that's a case where it's important, I think this is something that Hamas, for example, understands it's important to maintain the credibility of reports coming out of, out of Gaza. Because in a way, that's all that people in Gaza have, it, as, uh, you know, in terms of the outside world. Um, I had just one more point. Um, uh, yes, yeah, which is also to recognize imbalances in the in access to platforms and also in power. Um, and that involves things like extreme care with language. Some of the, th some of the things that um, Mike and Dina were talking about in the way in which things are so asymmetrically described is, a is absolutely unreal. Um, Palestinians mysteriously die. Um, Israelis are subjected to massacres and so on and so forth. Um, and I think, um, yeah, and, and, you know, and, and also I think we rest quite easy that we might sometimes be open to accusations of bias. So, for example, because we had this structural knowledge and this knowledge of the history of conflicts in, in the region in the past, as soon as October 7th happened, we knew exactly what we would need to be reporting on very quickly. And I think for, as a result, for example, we didn't report that much on October 7th itself. And I think for us, that's fine because our job is to provide a counterpoint to uh, the way in which the media has in gen generally focused on their, uh, wh where the media focused when, when these events um, un unfolded. Um, yeah, so that's, that's my five principles. Well, I'd like to thank all the panelists. That's been a a very, very rich amount of, of things to think about and facts and different ideas. And now it's uh, over to you. Uh, it's a Q&A that uh, we've now got for a little while. Um, I'm, I'm going to take, I think, three people at a time and then we'll see how we get on. Uh, and obviously, if you want to ask somebody something to one of the panellists, then 
please say when you're doing it. If you want to make a general question to everybody, if you want to make a contribution, please keep it pretty short so that we can get as many in as possible. So who would like to say something? The woman at the back. Yeah. That's you, yeah. There's, oh, yes. there's, uh, Sorry, can you just wait for one sec? Hello. Okay, there we go. Right. Hi, my name is Brandon. Uh, I'm a SOAS alumni and currently a due diligence analyst in a due diligence firm. Just got a question, a very general question for the panel. Is grassroots censorship more dangerous than state-led censorship? And if so, what is the case for free media in terms of corporate ownership? And is a free media therefore not conducive to the prevention of the accusations of double standards that the global south has uh, thrown onto the West recently. Thank you very much. Somebody, who's next? Who's going to say something next? Just, just wait for the mic and then we can. Um, yeah, so I'm from SOAS as well. I'm a second year studying politics and international relations, and I have two questions, if that's okay. One is uh, for you, Dina, uh, which is if um, the UK is potentially found on, on like being guilty of war crimes um, based on their funding through like Elbit systems and other um, arms factories um, in the genocide in Gaza. Do you think the media um, covering is going to change? And if so, how? And I have another question, which is for Gideon. And um, so I know uh, Haaretz and Plus972 are a bit more leftist and have covered um, a bit more openly about the genocide and about war crimes in Gaza. Um, but then I also know that a lot of leftist individuals and leftist organizations have stopped doing so and have become a bit more central ever, ever since um, the 7th of October. And you also have the right, like leaning um, news outlets like Channel 12 and stuff like that who have become more radical. Do you think that's gonna change if um, uh, Israel is you know, officially held accountable for committing genocide? <laughs> Thanks very much. Somebody else has somebody at the front here. Hi. Oh, this works. Um, this is for everyone. I'm just curious, probably hard to quantify, but um, to what extent would you say British media in particular is completely aware of all the biases they have and decide to just be complicit in them? Or do you think on the part of a lot of working journalists, this is just completely subconscious? Hey, thanks very much. That's that was a very, very good question. So I think I'll ask Gideon. Gideon, would you like to come back and respond? One was directly for you, but uh, the other two as well. Obviously, please do say something about. Thank you. I'd rather answer the question which was uh, pointed at me, at least the academic <coughs> who know much more about the two other questions. And, and the question was a, a very interesting one. Uh, Israel changed dramatically over the 70s. Uh, we cannot yet see how solid is the change and how long will it last and how deep is it. But it's very clear that the last remains of the Israeli peace camp and the last remains of the Israeli left were quite hit on the 70s. Many, many leftists or so called leftists say that after the sevens, game is over, we have no empathy to the Palestinians, no empathy to Gaza, no interest in Gaza, we don't want to hear, we don't want to know after what they have done to us. Which would lead us to many uh, uh, conclusions. If one attack, as brutal as it was, changes the minds of, of, of the peace camp. Imagine yourself what happens in the Palestinian public opinion and discourse when brutal attacks are 
taking place for decades now. But that's just by the way. Now the question was if Israel will finally be taking accountable for genocide, will it change this this uh, tendency of Israel to become more nationalistic, more racist, more militaristic after the seven? So one should know that Israel has a lot of protection walls, part of them because of the media, against any critics of the world. The first one is obviously labeling as anti-Semites anyone who dares to say any critic about Israel. Anyone who expresses any kind of critics about Israel, about the occupation, about the apartheid, is labeled in Israel as an anti-Semite. And that's very um, comfortable because if you do so, so it's your fault, not ours. We are clean and, 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 and innocent. I think that if the International Court of Justice will finally get a resolution that Israel committed a genocide, it will not change anything in Israeli public opinion because even this information will go through the filters, through the go-between of the Israeli media, namely labeling the International Court of Justice as an anti-Semite organization. And then it's not our fault, it's their fault. They should be blamed, not us. So don't expect too much from any kind of international resolutions because Israel will always find some protection. The only way to change really things is Israelis to start to pay to be punished personally. Then people might start to ask, is it worth it? Are we really ready to pay a price for settlements, for the occupation, for the apartheid, you name it? But as long as it will be only declarative, I don't see it changing anything in the Israeli map. And if it will change anything in the Israeli map, it will make Israel even more nationalistic and more uh, racist, claiming again and again, the world is against all of us, the world is always against us, no matter what we do, which is, by the way, a total lie, obviously, because when Israel went for all kinds of peace initiatives, the world had and Israel is still the biggest darling of the West, even though it's becoming so criticized. So to sum it up, it will not be enough for the creation of any organization to change Israeli point of view or Israelis point of view. The only hope is that only practical measures against Israel might Again, I'm not sure. Might bring Israelis to the question: Are we really ready to pay this price? Thank you very much, Gideon. I'm going to ask Dina to come back on her question that was directly to her, but also to the other ones, and then I'll bring the other two uh, panelists in. Um, thank you so much your, uh, to your question. You know, the, your, your question, if I kind of phrase it correctly, is that if the UK were found to be complicit in war crimes, would the media coverage change? You must remember that the media, you know, does have certain functions, particularly in uh, democracies or so-called democracies. And the functions are to hold government, one of them is to hold government accountable. Uh, and I would not really uh, make any kind of judgment now, but I think that the media would want to report um, and hold government accountable if that were the case. Now, why is this, you know, the reason that we are talking about Israel-Palestine, um, and I don't want to use the term exceptional or exceptionalism to talk about Palestine because that kind of um, negates the whole thing, you know, it's an exceptional case, so everything can happen. Uh, but in a sense, it's important to think about it as perhaps a unique, a unique, uh, to a certain extent, a unique case where you have 
a, a lot of interlinking of uh, you know uh, foreign relations, uh, international relations, uh, uh, power um, imperatives, strategic issues, uh, support for Israel, uh, the history of Israel uh, as it started, and so on. Um, and in a sense, the, the complicity of uh, the West in uh, the, the, the dispossession of the Palestinians from 1948 up to the present and even before since the Balfour Declaration. Um, so, but in response to your question, I think the media would, would be, uh, you know, playing a, a, a different role, uh, I think, uh, because uh, journalists, you know, want to, want to pursue their jobs um, in, in ways that they tell the truth. So I think that that would be the case. Um, I didn't understand clearly the first question, but maybe uh, Mike can answer that. Which one was that? That was uh, one about is grassroots censorship more dangerous than. I'm, I'm not sure what you mean. Censorship. I don't know what you mean by grassroots censorship. For example, uh, uh, our ends is technically a free media state, right? It's not owned by the state, it's not owned by a government. However, it can transform itself into sounding nationalist rigs, sounding dehumanizing, et cetera, et cetera. Well, whereas Al Jazeera is state owned by no one. Well, and I think Gideon explained that in terms of the fact that, you know, the media will print what they think the public wants to hear. And in the aftermath of the atrocities on October the 7th, um, I think they felt that the, what the public wanted was probably quite kind of nationalistic coverage. Um, and that's what they gave them. And they felt probably that if they were going to do things that were going to challenge that, then they would potentially lose viewers. And I think this is very common in wartime. You know, there is a kind of frame for war coverage and it looks pretty much the same in terms of how, you know, the, the wars you look at from whatever context you're looking at, you tend to get kind of rally around the flag, you tend to get suppression of criticism. These are common for, for all wars. And I, I imagine for, you know, most organizations are a little bit nervous when, you know, would be nervous in the aftermath of something like October the 7th, that if they did feature dissent. So, so yes, to a certain, I don't know if I'd call that grassroots, I just, it's just to do with the commercial structures that most organizations work within, even Al Jazeera. Would just say so the, the lady at the front said, did, did the journalists know? Um, well, certainly there have been quite a lot of internal revolt amongst a number of journalism organisations. So we know at the LA Times, at the BBC, it was reported early on in the conflict, some of the journalists were crying in the toilets because of the fact that they felt that the, the coverage was wrong. Um, and, it, you know, they weren't, the BBC weren't getting it right. So I think there is awareness amongst probably lots of journalists, but journalists work within a particular set of pressures and constraints. And, you know, there's the, the role of things like public relations and also uh, uh, attempts to actually put pressure on media organizations. And all of these affect um, the kind of range of, of, of accounts that you get represented in media. But I think generally, um, particularly the, the journalists who know the conflict well, who are the specialists, yes, they probably are. Um, yeah, I was going to talk about the, the bias as well, but I wanted to just say something about Al Jazeera, which is that, um, you know, state-owned um, media will reflect the interests of the state. So, for example, Al Jazeera was not very good at covering <coughs> Yemen when Qatar was part of the coalition that was bombing its smithereens. Uh, so, yeah, so I think, you know, there are, um, yeah, it's not necessarily, um, a, um, a, 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 doesn't necessarily make for a free press. Um, on the on the biases question, I mean, I think like I actually don't understand how how bias in in journalism w works. So like one one case that I that I've thought about a lot. Uh, I mean, it must be it, it must be structural. It's, it, you know, like individual journalists don't actually have that much power in massive organisations. They're all parts of like very structured teams. But one example that I find so striking striking, which is that in January when the ICJ ruled. Uh, that it was plausible that Israel was committing genocide in Gaza. The same day, the UNRWA story came out, and every headline was dominated by the UNRWA story, uh, a story planted by Israel, um, saying that you know Hamas operatives had infiltrated UNRWA and et cetera, et cetera. 
And this historic moment where a state which has never held accountable for its actions was finally in some way held accountable was completely erased by the newspapers and the, and the broadcast media becoming obsessed with the UNRWA story. So why did they become obsessed with the UNRWA story? Well, part of it is that news broadcasting and selling newspapers requires stories that tap into various psychological features of the audience. And what this story had was a kind of, again, a war on terror sort of paranoia to it, so that there are these like agents in your um, esteemed institutions which are in fact working um, for you know, whatever, whatever the, the nightmare is supposed to be. That sells more papers and that's more exciting than um, what is actually the most historic part of the day, which was the ICJ, ICJ ruling. But I also think it's often the case that, that journalists just don't understand the significance sometimes of what's, what's happening because they don't pay attention to these structural facts, which are the ones that I was trying to talk about and that um, Mike and Dio were talking about as well. Um, so I think the, bi the bias is not aware. I mean, on, sorry, I was just going to say on the BBC, I, there was actually a group of journalists who got in touch with us and I ended up speaking to them because they wanted to write, they wanted us to publish a letter um, about how unhappy they were with the BBC's coverage. And when I spoke to them and I was sort of thinking about, like, can we publish this letter? What they? they were really unable to articulate what it was about the coverage that they were unhappy with. So they weren't, they just wanted it to be better, but they weren't able to say why. And I think that's because the kind of institutional bias is so ingrained that they know something is wrong, but they're not able to identify exactly why it's wrong. Okay, thanks. Well, there's a, somebody here who'd like to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Following on your point about the BBC and about the pressures the journalists are under there, do you think we're maybe underestimating the sometimes direct political pressure that the, journal, that the journalists are under as a, as, a, as a major news organization when the director general, who's obviously appointed by the government, is also the editor in chief of the whole news organization? And the pressure upon him must be enormous from government, and he must in turn pass that pressure on to the people who are working for him. And it's rather more naked than maybe we think it, it really is. Okay, thanks. A couple more. One there, one there, and then... both of you, so one after the other. Okay, hi, okay. this is working, hi. I'm Yasser Khaleri, I'm with the Open Society Foundation. Uh, I'd like to make a, a, ask a question about the role of Western media in influencing global South or global majority media, right? Namely because, I mean, a lot of the main media outlets in Latin America, be it uh, West Africa, East Africa, as you, you surely know, uh, Southeast Asia, they do not have many correspondents on the ground, right? So most of what happens is they get their information from Western media that do have people on the ground and are biased and everything, just as you, you've been very eloquently explaining. Now, uh, before my questions, in, in my view, I think it's quite important that the, that the population in these places kind of have have a, uh, a culturally sen sensitive and tailored uh, uh, coverage of this issue also because they need to have, um, well, you know, we, everyone that isn't, that belong to the, those regions have to be able to pressure their own governments in a way that will have kind of like a, a, su a sustained approach to this issue that is irrespective of whether or not in a specific point in time there is a progressive government ruling that country. Right? I'm mentioning, I'm talking about Brazil, for example, or Colombia. Right now they're very good because they have progressive governments. Uh, in two, three years, fascists, fascists might come back, like Bolsonaro, and then it will go back to, to where it was, right? Could so- you get to the question? I will ask the question now. So how do you think that media in these regions could be a better place to, to cover the situation in a way that is not influenced by Western media, essentially. Thanks, and yeah, thanks for the super interesting discussion so far. I wanted to pick up on a thread kind of that was um, started by, by, you, by Dina mentioning the role of social media in particular um, 
and you alluded to kind of an uncertainty or an unclarity right now in the big picture of how that has changed things when we think of these kind of long-term structural factors leading to you know the perpetuation of this status quo but obviously the media landscape has dramatically shifted because of social media and I think like there's a lot of I mean we can assume there's certain ambivalent impacts of that including a greater awareness of the atrocities we see what's happening more people see directly what's happening in Gaza see the genocide unfolding before their eyes and I think there's certain solidarities that emerge because of that but then as you alluded to there's these, there's these like the the political economy of the internet, of social media, of these platforms, means that there's certain biases inherent in them, and that kind of reinforces support for the imperialist policies that are unfolding, as well among certain key constituencies. But and and, and like these are obviously different threads that are pulling in different directions. But I'd love to just, although the data is not there, obviously, like this massive data set of understanding the overall impact, I'd love to know how you feel this is is can and is changing things politically the overall impact of where we're getting to in terms of global solidarity for the palestinians understanding of the root causes um because yeah i, I mean i work on on tech accountability and this is very much the questions that we grapple with day today but i'd be really interested from this media perspective thank as well you. thanks thank you and just the woman here and then we'll come back to the panel hi I've got a question for Gideon. Um, hi, Gideon. I've heard you speak about um, one democratic state a lot in the past. In the current context and how you've seen, you've said that the left has also swung to the center and towards the right. Do you think one democratic state is actually possible with the kind of mindset that Israelis have, especially since October the 7th? Okay, thanks for those. I'm going to ask Dina to come back first because she has to leave. And she, um, and she has one. Oh, right. You um, have to leave yeah, don't worry. Okay, I'm well, let's not. take those two first. It, let's take those two first and then we'll, um, we'll see how we get on. Um, so there was a question about the media, what, what can the media in the global south and the global north, et cetera, what, what is the relationship between them? Um, and I think the relationship between them so one thing that you have to remember is that um, it really matters what represent, how you are represented in the global north because it does come up with this discourse around, okay, attitudes around discourses that, um, that become almost normalized. So somebody mentioned the fact, and I think it was Mike who said that, you know, in, in the reporting, we have the, these reporting of cycles of violence so that people become, you know, people who are watching the news, you say, oh, yeah, you know, that is happening all the time. These people are always violent. Um, and, and so it becomes commonsensical and accepted. Now, but there is something that one has to pay attention to, which is for those people who are affected by violence or who are um, in, in a situation where they are being violated or their lives are violated. It, it matters to them to see how, you know, how they are talked about, how they are represented. So this debate around the media of the global north and the global south uh, is a debate that, you know, is continuing. You know, why does it matter? Why, why is it important to say that we need to, ha I think, I hope I'm answering your question. But I, you know, it's, it's a big debate that we have in critical media and communication studies is what, where is knowledge produced? By whom does it get produced and why does it matter? And these questions, you know, require a lot of debate and a, a big answer from me, which I don't have the time to do, considering that we have uh, so many other questions. Um, the question about social media is, of course, important, particularly in terms of uh, the fact that social media can challenge or is already challenging uh, these dominant narratives. Uh, and these narratives that have continued to dominate the landscape for such a long time, and they become again taken for granted. And this is the problem. And one of the key problems around it, and this also pertains to your question, is the way that representations, you know, how people are represented and how they are talked about, um, they, they can also uh, be, you know, they, they are remnants of colonial practices and thinking. 
So we need to think about, you know, the, 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 the scholarship on, in post-colonial studies and the scholarship around, um, you know, representing the other. Edward Said has talked about that a lot. We have a fantastic scholar uh, who passed away, uh, Stuart Hall, really worth reading their stuff because it still is relevant today. It's still relevant to, to think about that. Social media has challenged legacy media, but legacy media, meaning mainstream media, continues to be important in setting agendas uh, and the agendas for, the, for you know, discussions. So, and this is where you have the idea of framing and the language that is used uh, is important to dissect and, and think about. But, but global media, uh, sorry, social media has been so important for the pro-Palestine Palestine solidarity campaign. And I think we, you know, it has been really important in terms of galvanizing, mobilizing people, providing spaces for a diversity of narratives and stories around it. Uh, oh, I mean, I think I'll also just kind of add, we should be a bit careful with social media because a lot of the material that is recycled on social media actually comes from the mainstream media. So it's not like they're kind of, you know, these two separate, completely different spheres. They, you know, there's a lot of crossover between the two. Um, What's going on in the global south? We certainly know that you know the the war is very unpopular in the the global south, and most people in the global south identify with Palestinians. Um, in in terms of the Western media, yes, there was a famous, very famous debate many years ago that I remember. Dina will certainly remember the UNESCO debate about the fact that there were, you know, it was said at the time that you know most of the kind of global information. Flows were dominated by the North. That's where all the major news organizations were, and these tended to, you know, dominate the conversation worldwide. I think there's less of that these days. There's, you know, the growth of um, particular regional um, news organizations that are important, and also obviously the growth of social media. When you look around the world, it's not just the media, it's also about opinion formers. The, the opinions of somebody like Lula or Bolsonaro. Those are also important for effective media agendas and also the kind of range of debate that's happening. What's happening in the ICJ is significant. The fact that millions of people over the last six months have marched through London, um, that is also something new and significant. So I think important things are afoot. How these new kind of information sources are affected public opinion is our next research project. But unfortunately, I don't have the data available yet. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Mike. Uh, Gideon, would you like to answer the, the question aimed at you and anything and any concluding remarks you, you'd like to make? Yeah, thank you. Uh, is Israeli democracy that the question that should be asked before the 7th and after the 7th of October? We cannot take it for granted, the answer, because as long as the occupation, and I don't want to get into it because it's not the subject of this evening, but as long as the occupation was perceived as something temporary, so it was very easy to define Israel as a democracy, having a, a, a military occupation backyard, and um, it was legitimate. But by definition, a military occupation, according to international law, can be such only if it's a temporary phenomenon. Now, after over 50, 55 years of occupation of the West Bank and Gaza, nobody can seriously claim anymore that this is temporary. And therefore, Israel stopped being just a democracy with a military occupation in its backyard. And it turned into a different thing. Now, no doubt that the, the regime in the occupied territories and mainly in the West Bank is an apartheid regime, no doubt about it. I mean, it's a matter of, of fact. It looks like apartheid, it behaves like apartheid, it is apartheid. I don't think I have to elaborate on this in SOAS. But if in the West Bank and in Gaza in different terms, it is an apartheid system. So it defines the entire regime of Israel. It cannot be defined as democracy. There is no democracy with an apartheid system in its backyard. It defines the regime of Israel. So even if, if we still agree that Jewish citizens of Israel live in an 
liberal democracy with a lot of cracks in the last two, three years, a lot of dangers, with many, many more cracks in the last six months. I guess you all know that lecturers were, were fired from the universities because of expressing empathy with Gaza. I want to tell you that people were taken to interrogation, even to court, because of empathy with Gaza. I want to remind you that the Israeli Arab community, those two Israeli Palestinians who have Israeli citizenship, are totally paralyzed in the last half year because they live in fear and they hardly express their views. Those are not a characteristic of any democracy. Okay, even the situation of the Palestinian prisoners, Israeli prison, which totally deteriorated ever since the 7th of October. I'm bringing tomorrow a devastating um, testimony of a prisoner who was released last week from what's going on in Israeli prison. This is not a democracy. And, uh, and the 7th of October made Israel even less democratic even among its Jewish population. And again, the media stares at it and does not interfere and does not fight against it, even though it might also affect the Israeli media party. So, and this might be also a concluding remark, in Israel at least, and obviously much more in Gaza, we are facing very dark days now, and there are very little prospects for perspective for any kind of very optimistic scenario, how we are getting out of all this. And we should remember always, at least in Israel, the role of the media, don't underestimate it, don't underappreciate it. And in the case of Israel, even though social media has its role, but still the well-established media has more influence or no less influence than the social media, we should always remember the destructive role that Israeli media played in this war and its, its effects on the fact that this war is now seven months old and there is very, very little resistance in Israel against the war. There are many demonstrations in Israel. They want to see the government fall. They want to see the hostages being released. Very few voices call to stop the war. And we should thank the Israeli media for this. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> and solidarity to you, Gideon. And lastly, I'd just like to ask Stephen to make some concluding remarks and answer any of the questions. Thank you. I was just going to um, go to the question on social media and building solidarity, global solidarity. I mean, I'm like a TikTok addict. It's like a problem. And like part of a problem <laughs> arises from the building of parasocial relations. And I think that what those platforms do amazingly well is that they put people in touch not only with um, other people around the world who are involved in activism, for example, and who inspire them to get involved themselves, but also directly with people in, for example, Gaza, who, you know, some of whom are doing amazing work, reporting their lives in a war, in, in a war zone. Um, and so I think, the, yeah, there's this power of social media, which is quite different from the mainstream media, which is that it puts you directly in touch, or so it seems anyway, with the thinking of another individual who's just like you in many ways. Um, and then just on um, uh, journalism and the, the global south, and I, and I take it the question is like, how do you get out of the the the, the thing of repurposing Western media and re reproduce reproducing its concepts, its knowledge, and so on and so forth? Um, you know, journalism is so expensive; it's unbelievably expensive to do, and that's why I think so many people are reliant on these massive corporate media platforms. Um, but I mean. I would say this because I'm from one, but I'm a real believer in independent media. And I think that 
encouraging the growth of independent media, which is as it were independent from the state, but also independent of, from corporate media, is the way to do journalism in the future. But it means that people have to be prepared to pay for their news. And this is the biggest barrier, I think, to a free press and inc increasingly a difficult, uh, almost an insurmountable barrier, is that people don't want to pay for their news. They'd rather watch an advert or, and, and then have, have the corporate news given to them. But actually, there needs to be a model developed whereby people are willing to, to they understand the value of a news which is free and, and independent and therefore are willing to pay for it. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thanks to, for all the questions. Thanks to the people at ICOP and SOAS who've organised this. It's been a tremendous event. Thanks for inviting me to chair it. And thank you. I hope everyone will give a, a very uh, good send off to our panel. Thank you very, very much. This doesn't need saying at SOAS, but uh, please use this to challenge the narrative and to keep up the solidarity work. Thank you very much. Have a good evening.